I'd like to take some time this afternoon and look at what are our greatest blessings. It's often very much of interest how we come into the blessings that we share. You'll hear someone talk about their career and home life and college and how they went to work and how they ended up on top of things. And it's fascinating to see how they got there. Someone receives an inheritance and all the responsibilities that comes with it and they learn to manage it and there's blessing found in it. In Ephesians chapter 1, which will be our passage this evening, Paul writes of the exceedingly great blessings. And it's such an overwhelmingly big idea. We can literally say that God's plan to choose us in Christ is older than dirt because it was indeed before the foundation of the world. He tells them how they arrived at this. They tell them how God has chosen them. We're told in other parts of scripture that many perish because they do not have a love of the truth and so be saved. So in this, my goal this afternoon is to look at a very interesting topic of predestination and the reasons that we should love it. And so I would entitle this six reasons to love predestination. We will focus on verses five and six of chapter one. But I will read starting with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, these are truths that run deep. They run beyond our ability to grasp them. They run beyond our mind's ability to comprehend. And yet you have stated it so. You have placed these great blessings before us. Help us to be a people that come into a greater understanding and a greater affection to your holy person because of what you have done and how you tenderly lead us along and grow us throughout our lives. We bless you and ask for that help from your Holy Spirit in this hour to hear your word speak. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So one of the reasons I picked this passage, predestination is a very interesting topic. For me, it's a journey. I remember passing through several life stages with this idea of predestination. I walked the aisle in 1975. I began reading a chapter a day. Somewhere in the next 12 months, the Lord saved me. That's what I think. That's what I believe. And uh, the Lord knows for sure. But this was an unknown doctrine to me. I had that stage where I knew nothing at all of this. I was not introduced well to the scriptures. From there, I proceeded when I did begin to hear of it, it did not mesh with anything that I had learned in church. Anything I had learned of Christianity in those first young years, it did not have any hook, any foundation. And I denied it. Oh, of course I wouldn't believe that. Who ever heard of such a thing? And then I began to sneak in. Isn't it funny how sometimes you begin to get sight of a doctrine that you never saw before? And pretty soon, it becomes a backdrop against a whole panoramic view of Scripture. You begin seeing it in Genesis 3. You begin seeing it in the promise to Abraham. You begin seeing it in the law, the prophets projecting Christ. God saying, I will raise up my son. And, and you see this electing nature of God being brought forth. You see a truth of God's sovereignty uh, being put forth. So there was some truth, but that was a stage where I knew it was something true, but I didn't know how to hold that truth. And as I became into that truth, then my pendulum began to swing, that I make all the choices. And for a brief time, I was in that camp that said, man makes no free choice, right? 
Aren't you glad that God is patient? <laughs> As we're little learners and, you know, our pendulum is all over the place, but the good shepherd knows his sheep and he draws us along that path that he would feed us, that he would guide us, that he would teach us about himself. And it's amazing the progressions we go through. Uh, there was a period of time where I held it like a porcupine. I believe this is true, but, you know, how do you deal with this? And, and again, another objection was, you know, you don't use it for evangelism. I was, I was convinced by others that predestination squelches evangelism. I have a, a, an amazing verse coming up later that will uh, answer that. Ultimately, I came to a place, and to me it's marvelous that this should seem so unique with the word of God. I became one who loves the doctrine. For all my ignorance, all my defensiveness, not knowing how to defend it, for all my misunderstanding of it, God brought me to a place where I love it. And that's why I chose this. It's really, this, this sermon is actually a journey. It's almost more of a journey than it is a, an exposition. It's very reflective in nature. And so I would like to, this actually is going to be about half introduction, half the reasons to love it. And so I'd like to give a, a summary defense, because I think there's a lot of cloud cover that is around our idea of, of predestination. Uh, I'm not exhaustive in any sense, but I think there's some things we can lay to rest, and so we can come to this passage in a way uh, that is... We know we are standing on the rock. So I'd like to, for introduction, I'd like to look at the journey. We just looked at that. Uh, views that are held about this doctrine, and then some objections answered. So three, there are uh, three views. And first one is denial of the doctrine. Just outright denial. It's not there. It means something else. God foreknew. Um, it's not God making a choice or a decree. He simply knew it. Uh, but this is actually very short-lived because the Bible puts it forth uh, just as he does in our current passage. But again, it begins popping up everywhere in Romans 9. Uh, in fact, that his purpose in election would stand is expressly the reason given uh, for Jacob and Esau. Uh, John 15, you have, you know, they, would not, they do not believe because they are not my sheep, the order being very direct. And to deny this doctrine, you actually end up playing whack-a-mole, right? Wherever it pops up in the scripture, if you're just going to deny it, you have to beat it back down. But pretty soon you find out there's a lot of places that it surfaces. And so I don't think this lasts very long. A second view, uh, predestination is based on foreknowledge. I think people probably dwell a little longer with this understanding. God's predestination, his choosing, he's looking down the corridors of time. He sees those who respond to his word. He says, oh, I mark you, I mark you, I mark you. And they say, well, God's choice really isn't a choice. It's really him foreseeing who will accept him. So really, man is driving the show. He comes. God recognizes it. God responds in a, in, after their lead for them becoming those that are chosen before the foundation of the world. This has some problems. First... The Greek is a wonderfully detailed language, right? You talk to someone about the love in the scriptures, like, oh, let me tell you about the seven types of love, right? Everything from phileo to agape. Well, the, the scriptures also have very distinct words for foreknowing and for choosing. And so the scripture in the Greek is very clear. Uh, prorizo, excuse all you real, all you real New Testament scholars uh, in the Greek, please excuse my pronunciation, uh, and prognosco, we can we can we understand the word prognosis, right? That would be to uh, find out. Uh, but there is a great difference between determining and foreknowing, and the scriptures make it clear. Secondly, saying predestination is based on foreknowledge also has the problem that it ultimately leads to a weak view of sin and an overestimation of man. In fact, I even heard that this last week at breakfast that man is good enough. Yes, he's in sin, but he's actually good enough to make the choice. And so man is overestimated in his ability. When, when Romans 5 says man is plunged into death, Adam entered into death, and all died in him, we see that man is not able. We see man making free choices in accordance with his nature. 
But man, but if we undersell what's the grievous nature of sin and we oversell man's ability, those two things are required foundations to say God is seeing and not choosing. If God looked down the corridors of time and we know sin is real and corrupting and we know man is dead in his sins, who would he see coming to him? He'd see men freely choosing, but they would be freely choosing according to their corrupt nature, which would never be him seeing them walk into the avenue where he could see them as accepting him. He does that first work. And so this idea that it's based on foreknowledge, and I I think I spent quite a few years uh, with this as my defense. And so the third view is predestination, pure and simple. Taking God at his word. This is the revelation. John Stott says, I love this phrase, this is a divine revelation and not a human speculation. And so, and then uh, Lloyd-Jones says, this is a statement and not an argument. God is not asking your opinion if you agree with predestination. He's saying, I chose you from before the foundation of the world. He's telling us the truth. Now, whether or not our finite mind can grasp that is, is a greater question. So that's the views, uh, objections, uh, and I'll wrap up the, uh, the introduction section with these objections answered. Uh, first, a, a bit of a meta-narrative in how I was rejecting this gospel. And I would think, I don't, I don't know who I'm indebted to, but I'm indebted to somebody. It might be Sproul or Lawson or Ryle. But someone said, man with his corrupted thinking and his pride and actually ignorance. Ignorance plus pride makes us think we see logical contradictions that aren't there. And let me put it this way. This is how I saw it when they were, when they were talking about it. Is you see a problem, you can only think of two ways to solve that problem. And if the scriptures don't match one of the two ways that your finite mind can think of, then you think you have a logical contradiction of the scriptures. But really, there's something much greater at work here. And that is that your finiteness has excluded real solutions that are outside your ability. And the fact that we are finite creatures receiving truth from an infinite God, we should be more aware. I should have been more aware in those years. And this is a wonderful truth that God teaches is that it's not what's in my mind that I, as a finite creature, establishes truth. It's what God, as an infinite being, is presenting to me that is truth. But when I can only think of two things, and you mix that with a little pride, I say there's only two solutions. It has to be one or the other. God can't be sovereign and man sovereign. That's a logical contradiction. Well, that's the finite mind saying I can only think of two ways of solving this problem and since there's nothing out there that I'm thinking of, this must be a logical contradiction. And so your finiteness makes you defensive. It certainly made me defensive because I couldn't defend it. And something happened when I came to praise God for the things I don't understand. That's when this doctrine became loved. To recognize God's majesty is beyond what I can comprehend and I worship him for that element of his character, for himself, that he is so far beyond me. It's just, it's just amazing to me that he would condescend to my level to even bring me with such ignorance to himself. But as a holy, infinite God, he's always doing and thinking and choosing those things that I cannot comprehend. At the same time, he brings me into a relationship where I am comforted, where I'm like a sheep who says, I don't know what he's doing, but I trust him. He's leading me to another pasture. I'm suffering a difficulty, but I trust him. I had a wonderful conversation with a brother at work many years ago. He had heard a sermon, which was, do you trust God enough to not know why? Do you trust God enough to not know why this trial is continuing when you had hoped it would have been over by now? That this trial is deeper than you had wanted. That the dots aren't connecting as you had wanted them. Why? Do you trust God enough to not know why? 
And I think that plays in, that's sort of the meta-narrative of my objection. If you can't think of it, and you can't think of a solution, there's a contradiction, now I'm defensive because I can't defend this. Oh, what about God's word? Is, is God's word going to fall apart? Is the foundation going to crack up? No, my finiteness is going to break up <laughs> uh, if it's not established on the truth. So objections, more specifically, um, arbitrary. To say God chooses his people, isn't that arbitrary? Isn't that completely without a logical, ordered basis? And I, I know God to be ordered in all these things. Interesting enough, the more I see this passage, the more I see multiple verses injecting purpose into God's choice. Verse 4 says he chose us that we would be holy and blameless. There is a purpose. He chose us, verse 5, according to the purpose of his will. This is loaded with purpose. And this was one of my main objections. Oh, isn't it arbitrary that God would pick some and not others? I don't know if you've heard that argument as well. But these verses, as they stand, face value. Even verse 6, that this, this predestination is to the praise of God's glory, of great, his glorious grace. I mean, the more you look at this passage and think, how is their purpose injected into predestination? This passage is just bringing forth, it's blossoming. It brings forth so many elements of it. A second objection uh, that is answered, that God is unjust to pick some and not others. And here, I know I've heard R.C. Sproul. I've read this as well. God is always just. If he were strictly just for all persons, outside of Christ, all would go to hell. His grace is seen that he pulls from, some from that condemnation and brings them in his son. It's a show of his mercy and his grace, his glorious grace that we have just read of. And so it would be condemnation for all. But God through Christ, in fact, is the just and the justifier. And then thirdly, I heard that predestination hinders evangelism. If God chooses them, why would you ever press upon people the need to make a choice for Christ, the need to repent in Christ? God's going to do what he's going to do. In Acts 18, we see it actually propels Paul into evangelism. Paul wants to leave the city. And in Acts 18, verse 10, God says, do not leave. I have many in this city. They weren't his yet. But he was choosing them. They would be there. It would become evident. And as Paul stayed, because of God saying he has his chosen people there, he continued in evangelism and became the means by which they came into the hearing of the gospel. And here's the verse that just, okay, picture in your mind, your, your brain just blowing apart. It was so glorious. Acts 2.23. If you're convinced you should never use predestination as evangelism, you will marvel that Peter says in Acts 2.23, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, sounds like sovereignty, decree, and predestination, you crucified, okay, there's man's free will, and killed by the hands of lawless men. As evangelism, he tells them God had this planned, that their wickedness is recognized, and that was their free choice to do it. And they said, what shall we do? And he says, repent and believe. And so it was actually used as evangelism. And I, I had, I, I'm not one of these people that believes in, uh, what is it, holy laughter or something like that. But I'll tell you what, this truth just so shined upon my heart at the time. I, I had to marvel at my awkward, my, my brain that wasn't in tune with his word. And yet a glorious sense of praise uh, that God brings all these things together. They hold together in him. They don't hold together in us. We as finite creatures lose our ability to fully describe God's sovereignty and man's finiteness. But in God, in his word, they all hold together. So those are the, the journey, the views, the objections answered. And now I'd like to get into the six reasons to love predestination. It's really going to be a simple walk through these verses. In fact, I often wonder, I think majority of Christianity, they get triggered by words like predestination and Calvinism. When you get in the neighborhood, a discussion that is in the neighborhood of election or predestination, I often think it might be best if you just say, well, I believe what God says in Ephesians 1. And let them start reading Ephesians. Don't, don't trigger them ahead of time with Calvinism and predestination. 
but say, I believe how it lays it out in Ephesians chapter 1. And just start stepping through it. Let the scriptures get there first. Because I think there's a short road to denying this doctrine. And to say predestination is like Calvinism. And I know I don't believe Calvinism, so let's just drop the whole topic. But if you say, oh, I just believe how it's laid out in Ephesians chapter 1. It brings it out. Uh, Once I was asked the question, are you a Calvinist? And I said, yes and no. And some people, I think, I imagine there were two surprised people in that audience. The ones were because I said yes, and the others because I said no. But then I had to describe it. I said, what I mean is this. Let's say we're looking through a window and we see a glorious sunset. I mean, this has blues and grays. It has the silver lining on the edge of the clouds. There's a deep red. There's, there's light beams of orange shooting through the mist under the clouds. And we're looking at this through a big picture window. And I begin to tell you how great that window is, that frame was set, when it was put in the building, you know, how clean that glass is. You've got to say, George, you're really a bit off here. The glory is what's beyond. Calvin brought forth wonderful truths of God's sovereignty as it addresses our salvation. Glorious, wonderful. Do I call myself in a Calvinist? Well, sometimes the word Calvinist, people carry the idea that you approve of everything that ever happened in his life. And that's usually how they denounce Calvin. Well, he wasn't into missions. Well, actually, you should see the missionaries he sent, knowing they would go to their death. He was an ardent educator instructing people to go into the mission field, knowing they would be sent back. Actually, it's quite inspiring, Calvin's endeavor for missions. But they think you have to, by saying Calvinist, you approve of his entire life. I love the sweet psalmist of David, or the sweet psalmist of Israel. I love the shepherd who sings and how often he's raised my heart. But do I agree with everything that happened in David's life? And do I call myself a Davidist? I don't. I marvel at the man. I've been spiritually helped by the man. God didn't bring forth the scriptures. Moses, especially as you read of Moses in Hebrews, statesman, prophet, priest, miracle worker, military advisor, uh, pilgrim in the wilderness. Uh, the more I read of him in Hebrews, the, the smaller of a man I feel like I am and the greater man he is. And yet, do I call myself a Mosesist? Do I, carte blanche, take all of Moses' life, the killing of an Egyptian and the smiting of the rock as something I agree with? No, I don't. We call ourselves Christians, I think, for that reason. And we call ourselves To be in him, briefly lost, oh, Christ alone is the one worthy of unreserved trust. These men are helpful. Church history is helpful. These things instruct us. We recognize the Holy Spirit has been teaching through the ages, and and we profit from those things. But Christ alone, his word alone, are worthy, worthy of unreserved trust. Okay, I said we're going to talk about the six reasons to love. Let's do it. These all start with, he predestined us. So the first reason to love predestination is that he predestined us in love. And I'll just simply read the scripture. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, to which he has blessed us in the beloved. So many of you can already figure out what the six are going to be simply based on those two verses. But the first one is that he predestined us in love. This is the manifold love of God poured forth to us. It is how he has loved us. It's like a shepherd who carries us on his shoulders. Can you picture the father, the prodigal son, filled with compassion, embracing him? This is that picture of love that God brings forth in predestination. A lot of times we don't connect predestination with the love of God. Some people think it's the farthest thing from it. But God leads with love in the description of choosing us before the foundation of the world of predestination. John reflects, behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us. Think of the verse that says, we love him because he first loved us. Now, when your mind says, oh, I understand the idea of predestination, this verse also is telling me. That God loved me first, and that's why I love him in response. Surely the love of God is a heart-stirring reason to love predestination. It is how God says to you in his word that I have loved you. 
Secondly, we love predestination because he predestined us for adoption as sons. He has given us his spirit of adoption. And by that spirit of adoption, we cry out, Abba, Father. We are brought into this great aspect of sonship. Uh, John Stott, in his book, Christian Mission, says many people know what they are saved from, but they don't think about what they are saved for. And you are saved for sonship. You are saved for this predestining is bringing you into the adoption of sons. How, how wonderful and glorious is that, that you have been adopted? We all have a father in Adam corrupt. We all have a line that deserves wrath and condemnation. He takes us from that. He adopts us, puts us in his family where we will live forever in Christ. Uh, I think in this past year, more than any other year, I've been able to think on the fact that we are an eternal here. We, all believers are an eternal family. And we're at the very, very, very beginning of a very, very, very long relationship with each other. Which to me just stirs me up to want to get along with everybody. <laughs> right? We're going to be at this a while and it's going to be a long-term blessing in an eternal family of God. And that's what God has done in adoption of sons. Another reason to love predestination is because it is for the adoption of sons. We have transitioned because of this predestination, we were under the law, but now adopted. Galatians 4, 5 tells us to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. We have a heritage in this adoption. Romans 9, 4 says they are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. So what a wonderful glorious thing to come into as the adoption of sons it also frames our future this adoption romans eight twenty three says not only creation but we ourselves who are, have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies so we have the already and the not yet there's a greater sense of this adoption to be bestowed upon us so the sonship is a wonderful reason to love predestination because it is for, why, why are we predestined? It is for the adoption of sons. Thirdly, he predestined us through Jesus Christ. As his followers, we are deeply interested in everything that comes through Christ. As we read the scriptures, do you not sometimes picture that this is Christ speaking to the multitude? This is Christ giving the bread to 4,000 and then 5,000? And those things that come through Christ, are we not closely connected to, desiring more of? These are the things that are pure because they come through Christ. This is a pure doctrine. It comes through Jesus Christ. It's a profitable doctrine. What has Christ given us that doesn't ultimately redound to the benefit of the sheep, the glory of his name? He came and he did all that his father would have him to do. And he says, I have glorified it. This is profitable. This is comforting doctrine. This is a wonderfully established truth because it is through Jesus Christ. Acts 10 tells us that the preaching of the good news of peace is through Jesus Christ. We have that sense of solidity, that sense of promise. Romans 5.21 tells us, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading in to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so a reason to love predestination is that it's through Christ. It's connected to Christ, the shepherd that loves you, uh, the one who is sent for you, that uh, loves us by giving his life for those he loves, giving his life a ransom for many. Fourthly, a reason to love predestination is that he predestined us according to the purpose of his will. Now for me, particularly thinking that Predestination is willy-nilly, it's arbitrary. No, it's according to the purpose of his will. If you want something that is solid and ordered and mindful to the infinite degree, it is the purpose of his own will. These are the things that are known to God. Now, maybe not known to me. I trust him for his mind and heart and counsel being so amazingly perfect as he himself is perfect. And so here he predestined us. And it's a reason to love it is that 
that has tremendous purpose. Because it's a purpose undiscovered at times doesn't mean it's not a purpose. This is God's glorious self. It's connected actually to the highest purpose that there is, one in God himself. Our new life is according to his plan. His new life, which I always like the phrase, it's older than dirt because he gave the promise the found it before the foundation of the world. It's determined by him who is all wisdom and compassion and power. What more do you want in purpose than to have this basis within the counsel and will of our Heavenly Father? So predestination becomes a wonderfully purposeful thing. And now we can begin to look for it. Now we can trust that. Uh, as far, again, to me, one thing this does, it sets the finite against the infinite. And we bless God because he is infinite. Fifthly, reason to love predestination. He predestined us to the praise of his glorious grace. So this has, a, this has a lot of things going on. It tells us the purpose, the end purpose. The other one was purpose of his self and his person. This is the end result of purpose is to the praise of his glorious grace. And as we speak of grace, we, we marvel that God would be so gracious to us. We love that he has been gracious to us. We love that it's to the praise of his glorious grace. This is the end result Praise God that any are saved. All are justly deserving of his condemnation outside of Christ. And here I think we know we can test ourselves to see if we hold this doctrine rightly. And that is, do we praise God for this doctrine of predestination? Do we thank him for choosing us? Do we marvel that he has shown such love for us, established it in Christ, and filled it with such purpose? We know we are wrong if we are turned in to bypass meadow, if we have our own ideas about what the love of God should be, or if we enter into the slew of despond uh, and don't see the connection of this doctrine uh, with the affection of our own heart. I think this point also could be a great banner for the coming year. Here we are in the first day of the year. Maybe this year should be a year where we endeavor to sing the praise of his glorious grace, to pray and praise him for his glorious grace. It's not that the end of what we do. We get in some real specifics. We get into various doctrines and marvelous miracles and the word of God. We see how he bears with men, how he corrects men, how he defends one man against another men, armies, all history. It's to the praise of his glorious grace. Sixthly, he predestined us to grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. We are outright blessed, brethren, and we're blessed in his son, in the beloved. It's not just a bare, hey, here's a check, you know, go take care of yourself. It's a blessing in the beloved. The affection he has for Christ, he envelops us in that same posture, that same compassion, that same love. Christ is unique as the Son of God, but we all share in the adoption of sons in that great love of God. There's a distinction, but we are also brought into it. But he has blessed us in the beloved. When I think of 1 John, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's really an advocate, isn't it? One that prevails before God on our behalf for our good. So the Father has this great love for the Son, and through the Son, he has blessed us and has that great love for us as well. And so what's better than having this blessing to hold on to? There is something better. It's having a Christ who will hold it for us eternally and wisely and wonderfully that we are sure to have that blessing. We can be given a blessing and lose it. But if we are blessed in the beloved if we are blessed in christ and we are in him and all is connected to him and he's holding that blessing for us so that it will be used at the right time if you remember passion and patience in pilgrim's progress one destroys the gifts they were given the other one waits to the appointed time christ knows how to give us that enjoyment of it how much and he knows how to hold it for a time when we are more mature to enjoy it so here are the reasons to love predestination, that the love of God is seen in it. It gives us the adoption of, as sons. It is through Christ and established. 
It shows the purpose of his will. It shows the praise of his glorious grace. And it shows that we are, beloved, we are blessed in the beloved. Uh, some quick application. First one is, don't consider yourself to know a doctrine until you love it. I think of so many stages of my life and so many years where I was you know, on the defensive or ignorant or denying it or holding it like a porcupine. But let us not consider that we really know a doctrine because they are glorious. As God gives them to us in his word. But let us, we don't really know it until we love it, do we? And secondly, it's very much like it. Don't consider yourself to know a doctrine until you love God for that doctrine. It proceeds from himself. The truth is a wonderful thing and it enlivens us. It's a whole next level up when you thank God for the truth that he has given us. When you have that relationship and affection and reliance and unreserved trust in him alone, this truth and loving it should naturally lead, what is it? Uh, doxology leads, leads to worship. My, my brain is getting a, a blank there, but it's wonderful. We love the truth and we're holding that rightly and we're understanding it rightly if that leads us to a love of God the Father. Thirdly, Test all things to see if they are through Christ. We have that connection. He is, we are blessed in the beloved. We are in him. All our hopes and dreams, they are in him. What, the teaching we receive this year, do we see it in his word? Do we see it coming through Christ? There's a lot of people proclaiming a lot of elements of supposed Christian truth. Let us test them to see if they are in Christ. I love the front material for the books in the Bible. I have a scroll Bible. I love outlines. But the scripture has to prove those things. I love that Calvin showed us and David showed us and Moses showed us these wonderful truths of his word. But the scripture has to prove those things. Let us test all things to make sure they are through Christ. And lastly, and again, I think this would be a great theme, a banner for this year coming up, stir yourself to the praise of his glorious grace. Let the end of this truth, this passage be that I want to praise God for his goodness and predestination, his love, his son, the blessedness, the purpose and counsel of his own will. And so we have these matters before us. Bless our God who has done all these things in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stand as those receiving great blessing from your hand. When we were ignorant and not mindful and corrupted in our thinking, not desiring the things of God, you chose us and you loved us and you set us to be adopted as sons. Lord, forever and throughout eternity, we will sing your praise for such greatness, for such love, that you would take us from the miry depths of sin and put us on the heights of your glorious grace. Our hearts are stirred and we thank you. And even now as we come to the table, we bless you and thank you as we see Christ. Please, Lord, seal these things to our hearts. Cause us to test all things to make sure they are in Christ, to winnow out those things that are not truth and to cling more tightly and to yield up more praise for those things that are of yourself. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.